Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Man of Steel podcast, a podcast independently produced by me, Kevin Flaherty, to discuss the Man of Steel himself, Joseph Stalin, and his state ideology of Marxism-Leninism. Through our ruthless criticism of everything Stalinist, we'll hope that with these four short episodes we'll be better able to understand how Papa Joe crafted his quasi-religious Soviet belief system and its effects not only in the USSR, but worldwide. Today we'll be discussing how Stalin transforms himself and Lenin into messianic heroic figures, but first we'll be looking into a history of Stalin and his relationship with Lenin before we get into exactly how Stalin perverts Lenin's ideology and really canonizes them both in the ideology of Marxism-Leninism. Stalin was born in a small town in Georgia called Gori. At this time, Georgia was under the uh, administration of the Russian Empire, as it was a very multinational empire that stretched from Finland and Poland in Eastern Europe all the way across Siberia to bordering Japan in the east. Stalin was actually a nickname that he picked up in his later years. He was born as, I'm going to try my very best to pronounce this, Yoseb Biserianus J. Jugashvili. A proper uh, Georgian name, which is completely unrelated linguistically to Slavic or any other Indo-European language. Uh, fun fact. Exactly why it sounds so um, interesting <laughs> and uh, is relatively difficult to pronounce. And yeah, uh, Yosef was born into a poor family and his father was a shoemaker. Even though he performed well in school, he was also commonly um, disciplined for acting out. And Stalin's rebellious behavior is most likely not unrelated to the fact that his father was an alcoholic. As Stalin got older, he gravitated towards a lot of radical socialist ideology, eventually settling on uh, Marxism, of course, and even for a period of uh, disarray in the Russian Empire, which was primarily between uh, 1905 and 1917, Stalin engaged in a lot of radical activities from publishing anti-government newspapers to working with anti-Russian uh, mob-like organizations in Georgia. After joining the Georgian branch of the Bolsheviks, Lenin first started giving Stalin featuring roles in specific party meetings and gatherings for his Georgian heritage as somewhat of a Georgian token boy. However, it was when Stalin published Marxism and the National Question, in which Stalin uh, renounced a lot of his original nationalist tendencies tending towards Georgian nationalism and embraced more of a classical Marxist line that Stalin really made an impression on Lenin. This is also where Stalin adopted his name Stalin, uh, Stal coming from Steel, as somewhat of a pseudonym to protect his identity, but also to make more of an impression within Bolshevik circles, as his former Georgian name was not as catchy or impactful as Stalin, coming from the Georgian Stal, meaning man of steel. And it's also believed that the pseudonym Stalin was taken somewhat in light of Lenin's pseudonym as it drew Stalin more close to being associated with Lenin and throughout his life and uh, his history in the Bolshevik party we'll see that Stalin really dedicates himself to making himself clearly known as a Leninist as a follower of Lenin far later on even whenever he started to assume more power within the Bolshevik party uh, whenever Lenin had passed away and it was viewed as somewhat of a contentious battle as to who would be his next successor. Stalin gave Trotsky, who was viewed by most party members to be Lenin's successor, uh, and was also a prominent general and theoretician within the Bolshevik party, uh, the wrong date for S Lenin's funeral. So, as a result, Trotsky had completely missed the funeral, while Stalin, who'd organized it, put himself somewhat center to the funeral to to imprint on the minds of the Soviet party or the Bolshevik party and the Russian people that he was indeed the legitimate successor to Lenin. Now, this was contradictory to a lot of Lenin's planning, actually. Lenin had warned a lot of the Bolshevik party that he viewed Stalin as very power hungry and did not trust him to succeed him as a uh, leader of the Bolshevik party in Russia. However, Stalin would be sure to suppress this, to suppress any indication that he might not be the legitimate successor to the throne, uh, so to speak. Now, following the death of Lenin, Stalin began a campaign to really adore and worship, in a sense, uh, Lenin and what he had done for the country. So overnight, Lenin, who was already viewed by so many Bolsheviks as a hero, by so many Russians as a hero and a liberator, was now canonized into a sainthood, was viewed 
as a legendary hero rather than an actual uh, revolutionary. So, for instance, his embalming uh, after his death was made to ensure that any Russian could view his body, and it was embalmed so well so that you can even view it today, and it doesn't look a tad decomposed, definitely looks lifeless. <laughs> even after Lenin's death, Stalin ordered that there was to be a examination of his brain during the autopsy to confirm that he was indeed a genius. And soon enough, of course, Lenin was made into an award for the Soviet people, as well as uh, his face was put on so many Soviet flags, red flags. He was paraded down the street. A portrait of Lenin was made uh, a commonplace object in most Russian homes. And Stalin now formalized the idea that we touched on in the previous podcast of Marxism-Leninism, a uniquely Russian and a uniquely Stalinist uh, ideology. And now we will delve into exactly how Marxism-Leninism perverts Lenin's philosophy. So firstly, in Lenin's book, State and Revolution, he outlines uh, what he calls the Vanguard Party, uh, what he believed the Bolshevik parties functioned to act as in which he believed that the most advanced elements of the proletariat, those who had the right consciousness, knew what they needed to do to sort of free themselves from the current conditions that they found themselves in, would organize into a communist party and lead all other members of the proletariat, as well as the peasantry, uh, to self-liberation against uh, the bourgeois and the bourgeois state. He viewed from projects uh, in the past, such as the 1871 Paris Commune, that a socialist party, a communist party, uh, will lead, will act as leadership to direct the rest of the proletariat and wage war against the bourgeois. Now, this uh, lashing out against the bourgeois, this assertion of the power of the people, so to speak, of the proletariat, was referred to by both Marx and Lenin as the dictatorship of the proletariat. Not necessarily what we'd understand in today's terms as a dictatorship, in which you have one man uh, leading but it was more so a worker's republic. Dictatorship was meant to outline that this new society wasn't dictated by the old bourgeois, but by the new proletarians. And this dictatorship of the proletariat would act as a transformative stage within society, which would find itself in conflict with capitalism. Now, Marx always used communism and socialism interchangeably. However, Lenin is unique as a theoretician to draw a line between the two and state that the transitionary society itself, the dictatorship of the proletariat, should be referred to as socialism, while what comes after, once class relations are abolished and there are no more classes, not even a proletariat, uh, that would be referred to as communism. However, Marx and, to a degree, Lenin were strict enough in the sense to recognize that within this transitionary society, exchange would still cease. What we would understand as a uh, market economy would no longer exist and would become purely a command economy run in a sort of bottom-up fashion with the guidance of a um, vanguard party made up by workers, by proletarians. So in his effort to formalize a lot of Lenin's ideology and what advancements he made from Marx, uh, Stalin sort of mixes up and pollutes a lot of the definitions. So in the way that Lenin views the Vanguard Party as members of the proletariat who happen to understand their conditions better than everybody else or happen to be uh, revolutionarily prepared for the upcoming society, Stalin sort of viewed the Vanguard Party more so as this polyboro, as this uh, pocket of intellectuals or of in-group members that would use the state not to guide the workers, but to legitimately control the workers and to um, regiment them to production, much in the same way that the previous capitalist societies had done. He also changes uh, how we understand the dictatorship of the proletariat, ironically, to be a legitimate dictatorship, one that is um, staunchly anti-democratic, uh, save for a few congresses between party members and some meetings between workers which acted more so as a suggestion box than actually affected legislation within the USSR. And finally, this transitionary state was turned into a Stalinist authoritarian state uh, 
which rather than constantly waging war against the bourgeois society would commonly make treaties and trade agreements with the rest of bourgeois society from taking lend leases during world war ii to even before world war ii or their involvement in world war ii making uh the molotov ribbentrop pact with nazi germany which contradicts a lot of how lenin viewed the vanguard as well as the communist party to still in the end be proletarian in nature to still be controlled by the people and mandated by the people now a lot of stalin's contradictions with lenin get muddled not only within soviet history but within our understanding of um, the ussr and the regime as it progressed as we still sort of see lenin as an authoritarian figure which he definitely had authoritarian tendencies within the bolshevik party However, whenever it came to how he viewed the fundamental nature of the Soviet state to um, ideally behave, did not encapsulate Stalin's brutal authoritarianism. A lot of the ways that these contradictions were hidden within the USSR was through, again, Stalin's iconography and adoration of Lenin after his death. The way how he uh, asserted himself as the successor to Lenin, and this iconography followed to adoration of Stalin himself, mandated by Stalin's dictatorial regime. This involves having Engels and Marx and Lenin, as well as Stalin's photo, all displayed next to each other during parades, uh, giant red banners made out of all of their faces, and uh, Stalin, through his iconography, also making it commonplace that Russians would have next to a Lenin portrait in their red corner in their room. Uh, they would also have a portrait of Stalin. And these red corners actually replaced previous religious iconography towards the Orthodox Church as there was growing contention and um, persecution towards religious members of the Russian working class as it was viewed as anti-communist. And these religious uh, organizations were also seen as parasites on society, uh, much in line with both Stalin and Lenin's rhetoric, both coming from Marx that religion was the opiate of the people, uh, that religion was the sigh of the oppressed creature, and so on, from his uh, economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. Eventually, all of this propaganda really snowballed into Stalin being affectionately referred to as Papa Joe, or as father of the Soviet Union. He was viewed as uh, unkillable, as almost invincible. Uh, especially his purges within the Communist Party and gulagging anybody viewed as a political opponent, uh, Stalin as God King sort of began to make sense as he had what was viewed as almost omnipotent power over Russians. And you found true believers of Stalin everywhere. Even the aforementioned Trotsky, um, the only individual who could really oppose Stalin as the rightful heir to the Soviet throne uh, whenever he was exiled in Mexico was later assassinated by Stalin by having a ice pick lodged into the back of his head. Within the communist world, it was seen almost impossible to escape Stalin's gaze through liberal use of secret police forces or to escape Stalin's power as he could at any time have you or your family members executed or gulagged. And for the uninformed, gulags were prison camps in Siberia, primarily in Siberia, in which you were worked usually to death and there was little expectation that you'd be returning. So from his seeming omnipotence to his omnipresence, it was no wonder that soon enough, not only was there a cult of personality reinforced with propaganda around Stalin, but he somewhat had the muscle to prove it uh, in terms of his manpower behind him and his brute firepower. However, as all proper religious leaders, uh, Stalin was not the only one to be adored here. Not only was there the legacy of Marx, Lenin, and Engels behind him, however, he began to somewhat canonize uh, at common workers to keep up the facade that he was a man of the people, that he adored the proletariat. Stalin began an award called Heroes of Socialist Labor, in which certain heroes of their nation would be granted awards in uh, either a success within technological fields or success on the front lines defending Russia from Nazi invaders. Also in the 30s, something called the Stankanovite movement was uh, started in which 
workers who exceeded their quotas were praised as um, heroes and looked up to in Soviet society, as others who fell below their quotas for what they were to produce that day were either threatened, had their rations taken away, or at worst, sent to the gulags to be executed. The movement was named after a individual named Alexei Saknov, who took nationalistic pride in exceeding his labor quotas and was later featured on lots of uh, Soviet posters and iconography to be used as propaganda to uh, encourage workers to work even harder uh, to fulfill the promise of a socialist utopia. So finally, wrapping things up, we understand the cherry on top of the ideology of Marxism-Leninism. Not only is there a pie in the sky that we can look forward to as we touched on on episode one, but we have our savior to lead us to the promised land. He's preceded by three prophets, Marx, Engels, and Lenin, all reimagined in his own image. And finally, himself, Papa Joe, Man of Steel, Stalin, using this transitionary state to lead us to our communist utopia just over the horizon. All powerful, all knowing, long live Stalin. And that wraps us up for this episode of the Man of Steel podcast. Join us next time for episode three, where we'll be talking about how Stalin's influence affected those in the USSR as well as those in the greater communist bloc. For all scholarly sources and also examples of Soviet iconography, be sure to check the show notes in the description. Thank you for listening. And remember to share, like, and comment this independent and entirely non-profit podcast brought to you by yours truly, Kevin Flaherty. Playing us out right now, Dmitry Shostakovich's Glory to Stalin, an original Soviet hymn.